uh, since yesterday uh, evening during the whole day and I have to uh, say that uh, it was really uh, useful. Uh, I think that uh, the need uh, for the open uh, Czech and German uh, discussion in uh, the current security environment in exchanging the open views on so many issues like uh, not just the cyber threats or the Russia hybrid war, what is the theme of the, uh, this public uh, panel, but also on many other issues like is uh, uh, the, uh, the role of Germany, uh, the role of Russia, uh, what does it mean, uh, the implication of Brexit, where we are with the transatlantic cooperation uh, in the light of the public perception of Donald Trump in particular among the German public opinion and, and, and the German politicians. So all those are uh, very important questions which uh, can uh, affect us uh, in our uh, fairy tale of, uh, uh, let's say, very much guaranteed security, what is the story of the last uh, uh, 25 years. So we had covered a broad range of issues and uh, it's almost agreed that it would be useful to repeat this, to include also uh, the people, for example, from businesses, because, uh, you know, one thing uh, is uh, the attitude of the uh, security uh, guys who perceived, uh, uh, for example, Russia entirely as a threat, but the business community uh, is also seeking some kind of opportunity, so it's uh, uh, a different uh, type of approach. So, uh, we had a great day, and this is uh, the final uh, stage of our seminar, this, uh, this public, uh, uh, public uh, debate, where uh, we will discuss mostly the theme of uh, the Czech and German uh, views uh, regarding uh, Russia's uh, hybrid war and the ways and means how to counter it. We have uh, four excellent speakers here. Tomáš uh, Poyar, who will serve as a moderator, will introduce them just to, to mention that on uh, the German side we have uh, Jürgen Bornemann, who is a uh, retired general of the German armed forces and uh, 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 I know him when he was serving as, uh, as uh, the director of the NATO IMS. Uh, we do have Christian uh, Wipperfeld, who is a scientist and expert from the German uh, DGAP, so Deutsche Gesellschaft for Fear Arsvetri Politik. We have uh, the two very well-known uh, participants from our country, who uh, Peter Kolas, who is... Uh, uh, who served as the ambassador both to, uh, to the U.S. and Russia, and uh, Daniel Bage uh, from the Czech NSA uh, Authority, specializing on, on the cyber, uh, countering the cyber threat. So he uh, took part uh, all the days with, uh, with us. So that's uh, just to, uh, to tell you uh, what uh, the today's uh, evening is about. Uh, uh, it's my uh, duty, of course, to, to thank to all those who helped us uh, with uh, making this evening a reality. My first thank uh, goes to, uh, to Zbigniew Pavlacik and his uh, uh, team, uh, Eliška Prchlíková in particular, who uh, 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 organized uh, most of uh, uh, the events uh, yesterday and today and, and brought the guests here. Uh, as uh, uh, a lot of uh, things deserves also the DAG, so it's a Deutsche Gesellschaft, Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft, so the partners organization to, uh, to Jagello 2000, so German Association for Atlantic Cooperation, in particular Dr. Burkhard Teile. We also have to thank uh, those who helped us uh, with financing this, so Hans Eidl Stiftung and Energy uh, uh, deserves a credit. So, that's all for the introduction. Uh, when uh, we have met at least some of us here the last time, uh, in fact discussing Germany with some uh, uh, 
uh, German speakers too. There was Roland Tichy having here. So I uh, uh, notified you that uh, we would have another event uh, before the summer break. Uh, we were expecting Andras Lanci and a discussion on uh, conservatism in Hungary. But I have to, uh, to, to announce that uh, Andras has asked us to postpone this for uh, the fall. So we will do this uh, most likely together with some Polish uh, participants discussing uh, kind of a Visegrad co uh, conservative attitudes to the current Europe. Uh, sometimes in the fall, so this is the last event, the last public event uh, before the, uh, the summer vacations. We will make you free to, uh, to your swimming and other uh, opportunities in this uh, weather. It's not the best way to, uh, to have uh, so many seminars if you have uh, more than 30 degrees. Uh, so that's all, and now I again welcome, thanks for coming, and I will pass the floor to Tomasz to moderate this. Thank you very much. Uh, the speakers have been already introduced, and of course you have the introduction more in detail uh, in front of you or on the front desk. Uh, uh, and uh, I will not be introducing them in more details, uh, not to steal the time uh, of uh, uh, their, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, of course, lecture, but their uh, comments, ideas, and then a debate uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, everyone will speak for five to eight minutes. Uh, we have altogether 75, 80 minutes, uh, uh, depending on the discussion. So everyone will speak five to eight minutes. Everyone will speak in English. Uh, everyone will speak uh, from the tables, not from the podium. Uh, uh, I can see some journalists here. It is on the record, uh, so I warn everyone. Uh, so no matter that the journalists are friendly, as at least those I do recognize. Uh, if, uh, it's not of the record session as in the, as in the morning, uh, and uh, so let's start. I will start according to uh, the order, as you can see here on the, uh, on the leaflet, uh, uh, and uh, I will then ask General Bornemann uh, to talk about uh, uh, NATO and Russia from his uh, uh, perspective. Uh, General, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, let me start by thanking the organizers of this conference for the invitation to take part not only in the seminar we had yesterday evening uh, and this morning, but also in this open event. It's always a pleasure for me to be in Prague again, especially when you have organized such an excellent weather. Uh, thank you to Mr. Vondra uh, in his uh, opening remarks where he referred to yesterday and today. Let me start by saying on behalf of the German delegation that we totally agree to his remarks of the value of those meetings where we had the chance to exchange views uh, of common interest. Uh, we, we concluded uh, to continue this dialogue in the future, and I personally believe this is especially important to continue this dialogue in times where intensified consultation and cooperation, especially between our two countries, is essential for our common security. As you have just heard, I was asked to contribute to the public debate this afternoon by making some remarks uh, on the NATO-Russia relationships. And this has been based, you could imagine, on my personal uh, experience after eight years working in several positions uh, in Brussels, in the NATO headquarters, as the head of the plans and policy division of the international military staff, but also a couple of years as a German military representative to the NATO and to the European Union, as well in my last appointment from 2010 to 2013 as a director general of the international military staff, the body who was responsible for the agenda of the NATO-Russia Council when it comes to military issues. So I will concentrate uh, on three personal remarks. So I'm not speaking for the German government or any organization. I'm only speaking uh, on behalf of my personal experiences. Number one, what was intended in the NATO-Russia relations? We always have to remind what was the intention of the creation of the NATO-Russia Council, 
which, by the way, is a special body, which was created especially for Russia, uh, while other nations uh, who are partners of NATO have been uh, part of the Partnership for Peace program, uh, where they meet together in a forum of sometimes 50 countries. So the NATO-Russia Council as a special uh, organization in Brussels was created as a body for consultation and cooperation with the Russian Federation. And I've looked again into the current NATO strategic concept, which was agreed uh, among the heads of states of government of the alliance in November 2010 during the NATO summit in Prague. And you will find a paragraph in this political document, which is still valid uh, on the NATO-Russia cooperation. And I will quote, NATO-Russia cooperation is of strategic importance as it contributes to creating a common space of peace, stability, and security. NATO poses no threat to Russia. On the contrary, we want to see a true strategic partnership between NATO and Russia, and we will act accordingly with the expectation of reciprocity from Russia. And in the next paragraph, NATO is making some proposals. What were the areas of cooperation where we would like to establish this strategic partnership with the Russian Federation. And the NATO was determined to enhance the political consultations and practical cooperation with Russia in areas of shared interest, including missile defense, counterterrorism, counter narcotics, counter piracy, and the promotion of wider international security. This was the intention on NATO side, and we agreed with the Russian Federation to, in, to implement these areas of common interest in cooperation measures year by year. So we developed in Brussels, together with the Russian uh, uh, delegation in, in NATO, an annual program, a program of political cooperation and consultation, but also a special program of military cooperation. And by the way, it was on the 14th of January 2014 where the Russian General Staff, General Gerasimov, was in Brussels and he signed on January 14, 2014, four weeks before the Maidan happened, he signed the program for 2014. So this was uh, the intention and the, the, the work of the NATO-Russia Council was on ministerial level, when ministers meet, foreign ministers and defense ministers with their Russian counterpart to give guidance to the Council uh, to continue the cooperation, but regularly on the level of ambassadors and military representatives. And I can tell you, I was personally responsible for the military elements of this cooperation, and I worked very closely with the Russian delegation. And there was a lot of interest on both sides to deepen this cooperation. So, after having said this, my second remark, what went wrong? Why aren't we today in a totally different situation? Uh, number one, what went wrong was perhaps the fact that the Russians had the feeling they have never been accepted on an equal basis. So the NATO-Russia Council was intended to be a body of 29 countries, 28 NATO countries and Russia. And to be honest, in the reality, it was a body of 28 who, who uh, sit, were sitting together, discussing the issues, and then confronted the issues to the one Russian side uh, in, in, the, in the meeting. So there was never a real debate among the 29. It was always 28 to 1, and the Russians realized that they are not arguing on an equal basis. Uh, one of the major issues which have hindered the NATO-Russia Council to be successful was a lack of trust. And I remember a meeting with General Makarov, who was at that time the Russian shot, where we came to the conclusion we have to work very hard on both sides, on the Russian side, but also on NATO side, to overcome the mistrust. And the mistrust has something to do with uh, the Russian perception of what has happened after the end of the Cold War. So uh, I personally believe the Russians have never 
seen the end of the Cold War as a liberation from communism. They have seen the end of the Cold War as a defeat, a defeat against the West and a defeat against NATO. And therefore, it was always a sort of mistrust which we haven't been able to overcome. And I personally believe this is one of the reasons why the situation has been deteriorated over the couple of years. The other point was, I call, would call it respect. It was always the side on the, on the Russian side, the request for respect. And respect with regard to the Russian status. They wanted to be seen as a superpower. And you will remember it was President Obama who said in a speech, Russia is no longer a superpower, it's a regional power. And this has also given a signal to the Russian side that uh, they are not at the same level. And respect means on an eye level, which means the counterpart for the Russian president is not the NATO Secretary General and is not Mrs. Merkel or the French president or the, the Czech uh, prime minister. It's the U.S. president. And if the U.S. president is not accepting Russia as a counterpart on eye level, it will not, not work. And the last point was, which maybe is one of the reasons why we are in so big troubles, this is the understanding of the Russian people, which we have not really understood and uh, uh, recognized, is how do they define security? Uh, based on the experience the Russians made over a couple, hundreds of years with Napoleon and Hitler, they come to the conclusion Russia can only be secure if they have a sort of uh, uh, cordon sanitaire outside the Russian territory. This was the case with the Brezhnev Doctrine, and I believe this is also the uh, issue of today. And this then would lead <coughs> to understand why Putin has said that the end of the Cold War was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, because Russia has lost its control of her near abroad. And this creates a threat to the, Russian, to the Russians as far as security uh, is uh, seen, and NATO enlargement is therefore an element for the Russians of insecurity. So where are we today? Number three, are we in a new Cold War? I don't think so. The, new, the Cold War was a special relation between East and West on a, in a worldwide dimension. We have a new situation, that's true, where Russia is no longer a partner, not, e not even a strategic <coughs> partner, Russia is a neighbor, uh, which is now posing threat to his, his Western neighbors. But for NATO, it's a different situation if you compare it with the Cold War. During the Cold War, we had a common understanding among all members of NATO where the threat comes from. It was from Norway to Turkey and from, from Denmark to Portugal, clear the threat comes from the East. This is no longer the case. If you talk about security with our colleagues in the Baltic states, you only get one threat, this is to the east, Russia. If you go to Portugal or Spain and speak with the colleagues on the threat uh, assessment, they do not talk about Russia. They talk about North Africa, and this is a big challenge for NATO. So uh, we are faced with different sorts of threats, and we have to find answers, and with regard to Russia, I think it's important to understand that uh, NATO must react on the new situation, and NATO has reacted. So NATO is still working. I think this is a very important message, even if the consensus building mechanism is becoming more and more difficult. NATO has responded. They have responded in Wales during the Wales summit in 2014 by developing some reassurance measures in order to convince our East European partners that whatever happens, they can be sure the commitments of the Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is still valid for all members. And I'm now happy to report that since yesterday, we also have the commitment of the new US administration by President Trump. You, there were some some uncertainties over the last week, but the reassurance measures 
is important to guarantee to a NATO member when something happens like the Ukraine, we are at your side. And in Warsaw last year, even the reassurance measures went one step further into the area of deterrence with, with the result that now NATO forces in a limited size, not threatening, threatening Russia, uh, but in a substantial way present on the territory of the Baltic states and in Poland. And at the same time, NATO has shown its readiness to continue the dialogue with Russia, but to continue the dialogue with Russia means you need a partner who want the dialogue with you. And we can discuss the issue, is Russia today a partner for a dialogue? Do they want to have a dialogue with NATO? I stop here at that point. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention, and I'm ready to go in more details in the discussion if you like to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to Christian uh, Wipperfeert, and uh, let's move to uh, the uh, German-Russian relations, uh, what trends we can see, uh, what changes there have been, and uh, possibly with some projection of what may have happened or what may happen after the German elections, because it's not only us who will have elections very soon, but even sooner there will be elections in Germany. So what will be the uh, constant, uh, uh, what will not change, and also where there may be some changes. So what is the status of the German-Russian relations now? Thank you for the invitation. Glad for being here. Glad for being in your wonderful city. Good evening. Um, I prepared some five theses. Uh, they will be perhaps some food for thought or for the following discussion. The first thesis is there won't be a German-Russian geopolitical understanding against the will of EU or NATO partners. Germany wants and will be an important part of the Western community. That is consensus in Germany. Just outsiders from the left and the right fringe do not share this consensus. They won't have a chance to influence German foreign policy. The second <clears throat> thesis, the West is divided about the appropriate Russia policy. The traditional German position, traditional means at least developed in the 90s, uh, the tradi traditional German position and the position of France, Italy and some other states is an enduring peace and stability in, in Europe are only possible when Russia is included and feels comfortable. Not just Russia, but not the least. So the traditional position of other countries is an enduring peace and stability in Europe is only possible when Russia is outside. Russia is a spoiler and cannot be trusted. Why this German position? First of all, the experience of detente, working, um, finding ways with the, with the East, uh, and the detente was very successful in the German view. Uh, the second reason, Germans have much more contact with Russians than, for example, Americans or British or perhaps any other people outside the former uh, Soviet Union. For example, um, German companies have 6,000 uh, offices or factories in Russia, uh, 12 times as much as French, for example. And the second reason, it would be possible to tell more something about that, just the third, nearly two million people from the former Soviet Union came to Germany after 1991, and these two million people tend to have a more positive view of uh, Russia than the German population in the average. So, uh, thesis number three, the German position concerning Russia changed consider considerably, and uh, this began already before Crimea and the war in the east of the Ukraine. But Germany is, in the Russian view, still the most trusted of the important Western countries, 
and the German interest, that, and the German interest in uh, the detente is not wholly gone. One example, uh, NATO-Russia Council. So there were no meetings for more than two years. The Germans and the French position was when we have a problem with someone, it's, it's better to speak with him. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and the position of other countries was uh, Russia can be trusted and should be punished for the things which happened in, in the Ukraine. So in April last year, the NATO-Russia Council convened, first time after more than two years. And in July, already the second time last year, one day uh, before the NATO-Russia Council convened, Putin phoned Merkel. And uh, Putin informed Merkel and asked for German goodwill because Russia made a proposal on this uh, NATO-Russia Council uh, concerning the safety of military flights on the Baltic Sea. Uh, this proposal was not very substantial. It was symbolically important and, and perhaps a, cons a constructive one. The German position was, and the position of, of several other countries, we should talk about that, uh, but the position of other countries was we can't trust the Russians, they want to divide the West. So uh, Steinmeier, the German foreign minister, he went in, into, into the offensive at the end of August. He proposed uh, confidence-building measures, discuss, discussions between the West and, and Russia, uh, and a new treaty for arms control. So in, in, in uh, September, two months after the, the Russian proposal, NATO declared uh, that the proposal won't be discussed in the NATO-Russia Council. Um, Germany afterwards searched for allies for the Steinmeier proposal, and in, in November uh, last year, 13 other foreign ministers openly took Steinmeier's side. So that means the critics of the discussions with the Russians, they have to give something because 14 countries with uh, Germany quite a lot. So already in, in December last year, the NATO-Russia Council convened once more, the third time last year, and uh, discussions about confidence building and arms control began, although not in the NATO-Russia Council, but with CE. So it um, seemed to be a little bit a uh, French-German success, but contradictions within the West prevail. Some, like, like Germany, um, think, are convinced of, we should talk for achieving results with the Russians, if possible. Yeah, we should talk for achieving results. The position of other countries is we are grudgingly open for discussion because the Germans and the French insisted on, on that, but to be honest, we don't want a result because the Russians can't be trusted. The fourth thesis, the social democrats are more interested in detente than the Christian democrats in, in Germany. For some reasons, detente is historically um, connected with social democrats like social democrats like Willy Brandt. The second reason, social democrats are more skeptical concerning the presentation of, of force and interventions. And the third reason, social democrats are more critical than Christian democrats of the Anglo-American way of capitalism and more critical of the way the US is performing foreign policy. So the Social Democrats are not pro-Russian, but they are more um, US skeptical than the Christian Democrats. Um, the last thesis, outlook, first of all, short term. Um, I have three, four minutes? Two to three. Two to three, okay, okay. 
2% uh, for defense. So all German parties are skeptical. The Social Democrats are more skeptical than the Christian Democrats. So this 2% uh, will, will be one of the more important themes during the election campaign, but uh, will not be a decisive one. In autumn last year, it seems possible that a kind of uh, detente um, could become an important theme in the election campaign. This is not uh, realistic anymore. Uh, a social democratic-led German government would be more interested in confidence building than a Christian democratic-led, but the difference is not so decisive. And it is uh, very probable now that the new government after the elections in, in autumn will be once more led by Merkel. So outlook in the long term. Something very substantial changed because of the enlargement of uh, NATO and EU. So um, <clears throat> more critical, more Russia-critical positions became much more known in Germany and influential than before. Before, before 2004, perhaps, sometimes uh, in Germany a view prevailed Russia first. That means the German-Russian relationship is, is more important for Germany than the um, German relationship to the countries between Russia and Germany. So this is gone. Nowadays we have more or less than uh, Poland and the Baltics first point of view. Um, so the fears of the Baltic states or of, of Poland are widely discussed in Germany. Uh, the younger generation is, is less interested in, in Russia than the elderly. The elderly have experienced what impact um, a conflict with Russia could have and also what uh, detente with Russia, with Moscow, yeah, what impact this could have in the 70s and 80s. The younger are more inclined to view the world, the younger are less inclined to view to view the world also from a Russian perspective. The elderly, some, the elderly tend to view uh, the world sometimes also uh, from the Russian perspective to understand Russia. Uh, the younger are less inclined to do that. And the younger are more inclined to a value-based foreign policy, less to realpolitik than the elderly. So Germany and, and Russia became already less close during the last 10 to 12 years, and this tendency is a long-term one and will be stronger, I think, in the future. So let's resume. There won't be a German-Russian geopolitical understanding against the will of EU and NATO partners. The second, the West is divided, still divided, about the appropriate Russia policy, uh, third, um, <clears throat> the Russian interested interest in, in detente is not wholly gone. Uh, fourth, the Social Democrats are more interested in, in detente than the Christian Democrats, although uh, the difference is not decisive. And the short-term outlook, um, it's very probable that the next new German government after the elections uh, will be led by Merkel once more. Long term, Germany's Russia politics will have the tendency to be more critical in the, in the future than in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's now move to the two Czech speakers. Uh, uh, Daniel Bagge has been dealing with the cybersecurity issues. I have already mentioned uh, German elections and our elections. And of course, one of the topics between uh, Russia and the rest, or Russia and the West, uh, was the issue of elections and interference in the elections. Uh, uh, it was an issue, or it is an issue still, regarding the U.S. elections. Uh, it was an issue regarding the French presidential elections. Uh, uh, so let's uh, hear Daniel what he can say about it. But then I would uh, really like 
like to hear also afterwards uh, uh, your reaction uh, to what he says. Uh, how now in the German politics and facing the German elections, how much the issue of uh, voting threat and cyber threat regarding the elections is the issue and it's not. Uh, so, so based on what Daniel will say, and I don't know what he will say. I <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas, for the word. Um, thank the organizers for, for having me here today. I just would like to start with a few remarks concerning what was said by, by General Bornemann uh, to somehow frame my remarks. So linking to what was already said when it comes to the NATO-Russia Council, when they perceived it as uh, not being partners uh, on a strategic level, being it a block of 28 nations uh, contra one nation or one country, um, from the Russian perception, how do you deal with that? Uh, obviously, uh, you try to undermine, to disrupt the cohesion between the allies so you don't have to deal with the monolithic bloc. And how do you do that? Uh, on the strategic level, not only by setting the agenda, that's somehow problematic to some of the members, but mainly by, let's say, influencing some of the allies uh, on, on the political level. So they might change uh, the position towards uh, Russian Federation. Uh, small disclaimer, the technical stuff I'm going to speak about represents the national views, the political stuff is just my own. Um, so basically what, what, what would you do as a Russian Federation? You will try to, to, to dissow mistrust, to, to alter the political process in some of the countries. You will support uh, some of the candidates that are, let's say, inclined to accept your positions. It was already mentioned, you can see the financing of Marine Le Pen campaign. Um, her, let's say, visit to, to, to President Putin as a, as a favor. Um, well, the problem here is that when you have influenced the politics on the national level, uh, there is not much, um, let's say, common goals on the, on the NATO level then. And how would you do that? Uh, well, you can either alter the political system through, uh, let's say, some meddling in the elections, or you can simply set some agenda that's, uh, that's problematic, as I already said. The second remark I would like to react on was the cordon sanitaire uh, in the physical world. Um, the Russian Federation obviously is creating a cordon sanitaire in the cyberspace as well. And that's because their perception of uh, cybersecurity or information security, better put, is uh, three-layered. It's not protection of the infrastructure only as it was in the West for past few decades. It's mainly protection of the information. Then the second layer is uh, the, uh, let's say, interaction between the information and the consumer of the information, that uh, is within the realm of information operations. And then the third layer is the protection of the infrastructure itself. So they have a very different and more complex, I would say more holistic, uh, it was being a cool word, uh, approach to information slash cybersecurity than we do actually. And we start to realize this issue with uh, information spread, fake news, alternative facts, just in recent years. But it's highly problematic for, for little democracy to deal with that um, uh, in, a, in a, let's say, actionable way um, as how the Russian Federation is dealing with that. Okay, so now coming to the election part, going a little bit lower from the strategic level, how to dissolve the uh, discomfort among allies. Um, first, we have to ask, was the we have to identify the strategic goal of the potential adversary. Um, is it to just disrupt the elections, to shift the perception of the population? Do, do they want to change the election results? Well, you have to define this first to, under to somehow understand and identify the toolbox they are using. There are several vectors uh, emanating from cyberspace, how you can uh, disrupt the electoral process. Uh, you can divide it very simplistically into two main domains, and that's code and content. Um, you can sow uh, doubt into the fairness of the elections using both code and content, and I will speak about that later on. You can plant mistrust towards the institutions of, of your country, into the security apparatus, into the institutions responsible for the elections, that they are not able or capable of securing the fairness and freedom of the elections and so on. You can also use uh, leakage of sensitive information by hacking political secretariats of the parties that are taking part in the elections, or you can simply use some information that has been stolen uh, in past and just wait for the right moment, and I'm referring to the uh, cybersecurity incidents at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that happened, uh, happened uh, in January this year. Um, if I was the adversary, I'm not. Uh, if I was the adversary, I would just wait uh, until the situation calms down, and then right before the elections, I will start, uh, let's say, disseminating information from, from the leaked documents. Nobody has the capacity or time, giving the time frame of the elections, to verify each of it and say, this is true, this is not. 
people will just be reading stuff and there is no entity in the Czech Republic right now with the ability to say, well, uh, we have a clear communication strategy and we are going to deal with that. There is nothing like that, which is a big problem. And it's one of the things we have to learn from before it actually happens, based on the elections abroad in, in our uh, allied countries or partners. Um, when it comes to the code part, uh, you can plant malware in mm -hmm. the election process, despite the fact that the Czech Republic has an analog uh, electoral system. Uh, cyberspace is still underpinning it. We are throwing paper ballots into the boxes, uh, but when we are counting them, uh, we are using uh, ICT. Uh, and that's a crucial part when we have offered the assistance to the Czech Statistical Bureau, and we are actually evaluating some of the bottlenecks and gaps in security uh, when the ballot is making its journey from the box all the way to the Czech Statistical Bureau, where the election results are available to the public on the website or to some media outlets who are analyzing it and then using it for, for uh, let's say, news reporting. And there are so many ways how you can actually alter the results or you can alter the perception of, of the populace, of the general population, the voters. It can, own, it can also be just by hacking or defacing the website with the election results. And that's very, very simple. You don't actually have to implement any, anything sophisticated. Uh, if you go that further, uh, that far, and you actually implement, uh, implant some malware into the ICT infrastructure on the way of the ballot, there are two ways how you can actually uh, change the perception of, of, uh, of the voters or change even the polling numbers. One is hidden and one is plain. Uh, the hidden one is you don't tell anyone because your aim is to change the, the results. The second one is plain. You let the world know that you have planted something in there or uh, the process has been corrupted. And even without actually having made a change, uh, the people, again, the, the population, will start think about the fairness of the whole election. So one cybersecurity incident, which can be truthful or not, can actually disrupt it. So here you have like a technical solution in place. You have to have a technical solution in place that this cannot happen. But you also have to have a communication strategy if somebody just claims it. And this was the case of the uh, presidential elections in Ukraine when, when one of the parties uh, to the conflict stated, we have hacked the, the general um, uh, election committee. Uh, then the Ukrainian intelligence services, no, 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 they didn't. But the information was already out, and it, the discussion was not about did they really do it. It was to what extent. So you have to have the communication prevalence, which we don't, unfortunately. Uh, I have to stress that uh, uh, my bureau, where I'm working, uh, we are responsible for the protection of the infrastructure, not the content. But this is a point where all the stakeholders have to come together. And this, it was already discussed in the closed setting of the seminar today, to what extent should, uh, let's say, military, Ministry of Interior, Czech National Police, NGOs, our bureau work together. Hybrid warfare, which is uh, the underlying topic of this talk today, is uh, a combination of all the tools available. And to be able to actually confront all the tools, you have to use all the tools available to you as well. It's pretty hard, given that you have legislative mandates, so what you cannot, cannot do. Um, I already mentioned the technical assistance we are providing to the Czech Statistical Bureau by, by identif identifying some of the gaps and, and, and bottlenecks. Um, when it comes to the uh, content part, which I'm no expert on, uh, well, I mentioned that already, communication strategy. But uh, we are dealing with alternative facts, we are dealing with fake news, we are dealing even with uh, some political parties or politicians that are knowingly or unwittingly sharing or spreading some information that's not in the interest of, the, of uh, let's say, the country. Uh, I have no recipe for, for, for that, honestly. So when it comes to some lessons learned from, from what happened in the United States, or, or um, in other countries. Um, you should probably not have read it, but there is a leaked uh, top secret document from the National Security Agency of the United States that's publicly available now. Uh, it was a bad, bad situation that it actually leaked, but it mentions that there was an effort from, from a Russian, um, let's say, um, entity uh, trying to meddle with uh, the companies providing uh, ICT and software and, let's say, equipment for, for the voting system in the United States. And this is something that uh, 
it's very, very important to think about when we are dealing with protection of the, uh, of the electoral process. It's not only about the electoral process, the way of the ballot to the Czech Statistical Bureau, but it's also about the, uh, let's say, supply chain security. And there not much has been done here in, in these terms in, in the Czech Republic. Um, and I will close my remarks with this uh, very positive message, and I am ready to answer your questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's turn to Petr Kolaš and his view uh, uh, based on his experience from Washington, uh, Moscow, or whatever place he has served in the past. Please. Thank you, Tomáš. Uh, thank you very much for organizing that. I believe it's very, very important that we uh, finally uh, speak and talk to our German neighbors as to our strategic partners regarding the security in Europe. Uh, I have to start with the confession. Uh, when I was moved to uh, Russia, almost directly from the United States in 2010, with a three months break in, uh, in Prague, just to refresh my Russian language, uh, I came there with a dream uh, which was not caused by, uh, put by Obama's reset with Russia, but mostly uh, by my nature. I believe that we should really try our best to uh, create partnership with Russia, to create strategic partnership. Uh, of course, I had a lot of doubts, especially uh, when we witnessed uh, two years ago, uh, in 2008, the invasion of Russian troops to Georgia, uh, and I saw the very uh, weak reaction from the West to that. But still, I had a, somewhere in my memory the speech of President Václav Havel in the U.S. Congress in 1990 with the standing ovations when he said, I'm not quoting, it's um, I just paraphrase, he said, if you want to help us, please help Russia first uh, to be the normal country. Uh, unless Russia would be the normal country, we would have a problem, and we don't have a, a strategic partner in Russia. We have, again, the strategic challenger in case of Russia. Uh, Russia is challenging us mostly because of uh, the other dream, uh, totally different dream uh, president of Russia has. Mr. Uh, Putin, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, uh, actually uh, said it quite clearly already in 2007, the Munich uh, Security Conference, when he said that for him, the collapse of the Soviet Union is the most tragic event of uh, uh, 20th uh, century. Not fascism, not Nazism, not to wars, world wars, gulags, concentration camps, but the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, I, uh, honestly, uh, I, I uh, tried my best to uh, team up with other Europeans to convince our Russian partners that it's better to start with the trust building and with the cooperation, and they were quite effectively, uh, I can say it today, uh, from today's perspective, pretending that they take it seriously. Uh, by the way, Germans were always playing the key role because they, uh, Russians, have a huge respect to Germany. Uh, that was one of the first impressions I had when I came to Moscow as a freshman, when I saw the star of Mercedes-Benz on the top of the roof of uh, Cominterna building, uh, or the label on one of the shops in Moscow, u nas v magazine čistata nemeckovo kačestva. What it is mean, like a, uh, in our shop, uh, it's so clean like in the German uh, shop would be. Um, I remember also when I was in Petersburg how proud they were showing me what Germany did for the city. Uh, after the World War II, uh, uh, when they were showing me in some other places what the German uh, soldiers captured 
after the World War II and uh, actually withdrawn from Germany back to Russia, were building there and saying, well, you see, it was done by Germans and it still is perfect, in, in very perfect condition. So uh, I, uh, I believe that we, at that time, I believe that we could really try our best to, uh, to create kind of the partnership. Unfortunately, uh, they were testing us all time. I, uh, I think that they were really testing what is our limits, where, where we allow them to go. Uh, Ukraine uh, was the last test they did. Uh, and no surprise, after uh, Georgia uh, and our reaction to that, uh, they were really uh, convinced that we are not uh, ready to stand for our uh, allies, for our partners, for our values. Uh, and they actually uh, said, okay, uh, we are here now to uh, restore our sphere of influence and our uh, space of uh, uh, this cordon sanitaire around us, because unfortunately they really believe that if they want to be safe, they have to have some cordon sanitaire around them. Uh, but what is different from our perspective that we are also trying to influence our neighborhood to have it stable, prosperous, and peaceful. Uh, unfortunately, Russians do uh, the opposite. They are destabilizing uh, their neighborhood and they uh, are uh, making it very vulnerable. Uh, I uh, am also uh, quite sure and no doubts about it that they understand uh, that they can't actually com uh, compete with us militarily or economically. Uh, Neither that or uh, nor the other way they would win. So they choose the way which is uh, uh, their, I would say, great skill uh, to work with our emotions, to work with our uncertainty, uh, with uh, relativism of, of values and pretending that they are here as a last uh, guard for uh, traditional Christian values in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, they have a lot of sympathizers among us. These Trojan horses are not just the ordinary people or some journalists or some uh, NGOs. They are quite often, unfortunately, also people in very high political positions. And not only here in the Czech Republic, in all Europe. Uh, we could see uh, their attempts to influence elections in many countries. We notice, noticed who are their favorite politicians uh, in Netherlands, in Great Britain, in, in France, uh, but also in Germany. And it's pity to say that in Germany there are some Czech politicians uh, playing this uh, game with them. Uh, hopefully uh, after, uh, after German elections, uh, which would be another step to stabilize the situation in Europe, uh, we would uh, be able to react more effectively uh, and efficiently to, 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 to these Russian attempts. Uh, so uh, I uh, started with uh, uh, confession and I should finish with the confession. Uh, I really believe that for us uh, uh, in the Czech Republic but in Europe as such, uh, for us, it's very important to build partnerships like now we have, uh, we, we are starting with Germany. Uh, we, we need to have a debate with their experts. We need to uh, analyze and identify the ways where, which could be our defense, uh, effective defense. We have to work not only on the governmental level or with the, uh, our uh, intelligence services. We have to also work with NGOs, with journalists, and with public. Education uh, is uh, really essential uh, in, in uh, overcoming uh, their attempts to uh, destabilize us and to uh, play cards with fear and uncertainty. Chaos, that's something what they uh, would like to, to, to create in Europe uh, and we should not uh, give them a chance to, to do it. 
Uh, of course, I'm ready in our uh, discussion here to uh, answer questions which are related to my personal experience. Uh, one of the, uh, and I would conclude by that, one of the most forming uh, moments in my uh, uh, understanding of uh, Russian approach towards uh, uh, West uh, was done before I came to Russia when we were negotiating uh, with the United States missile defense projects uh, uh, when we were planning to build the U.S. Uh, radar, of, I would say NATO radar, uh, close to Prague. Uh, and we tried to convince uh, Russians uh, that this is not against them because they do not impose any uh, serious threat anymore for us. And I saw the disappointment in their eyes when I told them that they are not perceived as a threat anymore. Uh, because this is for many Russians, unfortunately for this close to Putin uh, and this style of uh, governance, uh, um, um, something what they don't like. Uh, they believe that if, we, if they should be respected, they has to be perceived as a, someone who can really uh, be dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very much. I must say that we were t trying also to reassure Germans that it's not against them, and it was not always e not always easy. But uh, that's for another <laughs> that's for another discussion. As, uh, at least uh, at that time, we did have uh, some consultations between Prague and Berlin also on these issues uh, and on the defense sec security issues. And I must say that uh, thanks to the pressure or challenge, as you want to call it, from Russia uh, towards the West or the rest, uh, then yes, we do have deeper cooperation between the Czech Republic and Germany. And for example, now Germany has soldiers in the Baltic states, we do have soldiers in the Baltic states, and without the pressure or without the instability created in Ukraine and other parts of Eastern Europe, that would not happen probably, and such reaction would not be on the table. Let me now use the opportunity of having two German guests here because uh, Peter and Daniel are uh, quite often here uh, commenting at the Institute and, uh, and uh, ask them three questions um, uh, regarding uh, their presentations and our understanding more of the German thinking and the trends in, uh, in Germany. Uh, one goes, what I already mentioned, to the elections. How much there is a fear, debate, of uh, realization of uh, uh, troubles uh, of, uh, or how much Germany is, at, is very easy with the fact or with the possibility or potential and I don't know if there is any regarding the hacking or meddling in the German ele uh, elections uh, from the Russian side. Uh, so is it an issue or not? If I may start, uh, clearly it is an issue. Uh, and uh, there's more and more the understanding in the, in the German public that uh, Russian intervention in the election process is not a fake news. We have to wait what the outcome of the investigations in the United States will be, but it seems to be very clear that there was something. And, uh, I, only, and I said it already this morning in the meeting, it was Putin himself who recently gave an indication that it is not a fake news, because in an interview a couple of days, he said clearly on the one side, it's not the state level who is intervening in this area, but there are patriots in Russia who should do the job. And if he uses the word patriots and not criminal elements, you would really understand what, what he means. So we have to be aware there will be activities in this area and there is also a, a certain Russian uh, minority, especially in East Germany, who could be used uh, for this process, and we have already some experience uh, in this area to, to, to send fake news into the media, uh, and they were very effective. Uh, I have several times over the couple of last couple of weeks watched Russia Today. It's a, an English-speaking uh, Russian TV, which is very popular, in, 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 especially in East Germany, and they are doing a good job. So if you, 
read, look for Russia today from the morning to the evening and have no access to other information, you see another world, which is totally different. Yeah. And I think if this is the case, we have to be aware of this. What, what, what are the possible answers? Very difficult to answer. What we have to do is be realistic in what we tell our public. This should be the request for our politicians. Don't use the election campaign to create misunderstandings. I think that's the only way we can counter it. Thank you. Is the Russia today in East Germany in English or German? Uh, it's, it's in English. Hmm? That's good But news. it's also in Russian, in Russian language, and most of the, of the East Germans speak Russian, especially the elder ones. We have more conflicts within the Western societies already for some years. I don't think that Russia is responsible for that, but Russia is sometimes using these frictions within the uh, Western societies and within the Western community. So uh, Russia is not res responsible for Brexit, for example. So, but it is clear uh, the Internet should be guarded better than in the past. And it should be also clear uh, the West should develop also um, the possibility for offensive in, in Internet. And this is, it's also obvious that not just some states have interest in uh, meddling in internal affairs in uh, in uh, Western countries, but also uh, Islamic ex extremists. And, and we know that the Islamic State is quite good in that. Let me ask the question number two, and it's regarding the sanctions. Yes, our president is arguing against the sanctions. Uh, yes, uh, Slovak prime minister, Hungarian prime minister are are arguing against the sanctions. Uh, yes, there are some politicians in the Western countries uh, arguing against the sanctions, but uh, I think that I, I could bet here that uh, the sanctions will not be toppled uh, by anyone from Eastern Europe or anyone from the new member states. Uh, there will be rhetoric, but the reality is not going to be that we would change the situation, the status quo. In my deep uh, feeling and persuasion is that the fate of sanctions will be decided in Germany. Uh, so what will be, for how long we will have the sanctions and what is the debate regarding the sanctions now and what do you expect uh, in the future? What will be the German position? The sanctions were necessary. There were no good solution, but the best we had, it, it, it would be a defeat for the West to remove the sanctions. That's the most important reason that they won't be removed during the next years, I think. But uh, the, sanctions, the sanctions are already less important than one or two years ago. Uh, for example, the German-Russian trade expanded during the first four months of this year, um, 30%. So the Russian side and, and Western companies, they found ways to circumvent these sanctions. They are symbolically important and perhaps very important. <coughs> If I, if I may add, uh, with only one remark, uh, I'm not in the government, so if I would be asked for advice, my advice would be remember what the reasons for the sanctions are, and as long as the reasons are valid, you must keep the sanctions in. Otherwise, you will lose credibility. Uh, and I think this is exactly the position of the German government at the moment, so there is, for the time being, not a real debate to lift the sanctions uh, uh, and I, I don't see it in the Western world in, in total. There was a risk in Paris if the elections of the president uh, would have gone the other way around. There would have been a lift of the sanctions, but the elections went well. Uh, the last elections uh, of yesterday went even well, so there's no, no pressure from, from France side. 
We don't know what the U.S. position at the moment is. Uh, we have heard some noises in the, in the campaign about the useless of the sanctions, but the new administration has not made a clear uh, announcement, at least to the public, what their policy with regard to sanctions is. What we hear in the background, and I, I'm just back from Washington, is the administration, as it is at the moment, give advice to the president not to lift the sanctions. So at the moment, I think we are in a stable situation. And this goes exactly to my third question, and that's about the state of the U.S.-German relations. And I mean between the Germany and German society and the American society, and between the administration uh, uh, in Berlin and, uh, and uh, uh, Washington. Not only regarding what happened in the last days in the, during the NATO summit, G7 meeting, uh, then the climate uh, uh, Paris agreement uh, decision uh, linked in, uh, made by President Trump, uh, but also in the longer term, uh, the, the NSA and, and uh, the issues. And, uh, and what can we expect now? And what is the trend there? And what, how the, uh, how the uh, U.S. German relations have changed and what we can expect uh, in, the, uh, in the upcoming years. And again, not regarding only the politicians and the decision makers, but also the societies. What is the view, if it can be simplified, like that of the German society and uh, United States of America, be it the administration, president, or the U.S. as such? I just said that I was uh, several times in the, in the U.S. during the campaign, uh, then the, the transition phase, and again uh, four weeks uh, ago. And my impression is, to, to whom you ever talk, there's a common understanding about the need to preserve the transatlantic relationship. There's no doubt about it. Uh, in Washington, but also uh, in Berlin, and I believe also in the whole Europe. So there is, there is a need to discuss how can we avoid a situation where the, both sides of the Atlantic is driving apart. And that there is a risk, I can tell you, has to do something with the opinion of the German population. For the first time in history, when you ask the German people, do you trust America? Only 32% trust America. This is the lowest rate ever have been in the history, and it's even lower than the trust to Russia. And this puts, I think, a very remarkable risk uh, in, in, into the situation. Uh, the, the, the government to government relations are, at the moment, uh, professional, I would say. You have seen the foreign minister was in Washington, Mrs. Merkel was in Washington. Uh, it was not always very helpful to read the next day what, what was written in Twitter about the meetings. It was a little bit different to what has been said in the press conferences. But uh, at the end, I believe there is no German politician uh, who really would argue we are at the end of the relationship between uh, Germany slash Europe with the United States because we fully understand we need each other. Uh, what we have to do is, who has some doubts in the U.S. administration, we have to talk to them. I think the best way to convince our American colleagues is to travel to Washington and try to convince the Americans to remember why they have been in NATO, not why we want them in NATO, why it is in the interest of the United States of America to have close relations to the Europeans because this is the best way to uh, create stability and freedom on both sides of the Atlantic. So it's our job to go to Washington and speak with everyone who has doubts in this. And there are some people who have doubts in this, sometimes close to the president. I do not think that the Germans are less pro-American than 10 or 20 years ago, but they, yeah, they want another America, so to say. Yeah? Perhaps it's not realistic. The cultural American influence is is uh, considerably bigger nowadays than 10 or 20 years ago. So the Germans want another America. Uh, Obama seemed to be someone who, 
who, who's a person for this other America, and uh, we will have another president in the United States in some years, perhaps even, even earlier. Uh, but I think uh, the problems within the American societies seem to be so grave that um, Germany and, and Europe should think more about working together for a future. Not against America, of course, would be the best solution transatlantic, transatlantic but the United States uh, seems to be in a deep, deep crisis. Not, it, it is not just this person, Trump, but it's a structural crisis. Thank you. Sasha. Uh, well, with your permission, maybe I would go a bit further with that last of Tomas' question uh, and focusing on this famous 2%. Because you have mentioned uh, briefly the two percent, but without uh, reaching any conclusion, that's exactly what uh, we have uh, understood also from uh, from the NATO summit. Uh, that's nothing new, those two, two percent. But in the past, we had the two advantages. First, we were somehow excused not filling the two percent of GDP per defence. Because our soldiers were deployed in those many American-led uh, uh, wars like in Afghanistan or Iraq, but that's now out. So we have no more this excuse that our soldiers are sacrificing their lives. Mali, it's not enough, of course. Uh, and secondly, we had to do with the rather value-based policies, so that was the Wilsonian type, but now we do have more real politic in, in Washington with, which is transactionally based. So here there are basically three options just based on pure logic. Either uh, you, uh, and because the British, the French, the Poles, they have to 2%, so it's uh, mostly about Germany, us, Spain, Italy, but Germany is a key country in that. So either you raise this two per, to the 2%, but just I as a now ordinary man listening uh, the statements uh, by SPD is against uh, and Angela Merkel originally in favor, but now is somehow departing and proposing, you know, to include the money spent for the humanitarian assistance, but this is something what would Washington never accept. So either you raise to 2%, but how then you have the problem with the German public opinion, or the Americans will forget about that and would not demand that, uh, what is highly unlikely to, or it means the marginalization of NATO but then we have the situation that Germany has a larger responsibility not to be just the moral leader or uh, the leader in respecting the rules uh, uh, within Europe, but it will be more and more about power and money in Europe. So what out of those three scenarios is the, high, the most likely from the German perspective? 2%, A, B, Americans would forgive and would continue to finance, or C, the marginalization of NATO, which out of those three logical uh, outcomes of the dilemma which is ahead of us is uh, the most likely to happen. If I may start, I want to, to re- uh, iterate, the 2% is not something which has been created by Mr. Trump. It is already NATO policy since 2002. And it was again reinvested in the, in the Wales Summit 2014, where the heads of states and government agreed. And now there is a point. Not to agree on a 2% level 
for the defense policy, but to agree to aim within the next 10 years to achieve it. So it's not a question whether we have really at 2024 the, 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 the 2 percent. If we have increased our defense budget step by step towards 2 percent, we then have to look into the outcome. Do we, with our aim to get to the 2 percent, do we get the necessary capabilities we require to, to make NATO relevant again? I think this is the issue we should discuss also with our public. We know exactly we have to do more. Yes, the Americans are right. What we have done over the past was not fair. 70% or 65% of the necessary funding of our common defense has been paid by, by the United States. Only 30, 35% by the Europeans. This is maybe not bad because we don't have a space program, we don't have a nuclear program, and, and, and. So uh, the question is, how do we make better use of existing money, which is a limited resource in the European context? I think this is the focus. Spending more money, yes, but at the same time look into the question, how can we make better use of what we have? Because we have not done very well in the past. Uh, with those 35% of the, of the money which we put in the defense budget, we only have 15% operational output, which means we are not very effective. And this is a mechanism where we should do something. And I think this wake-up call has been understood by the leaders of the European Union. If you see that for the first time the Europeans are discussing at the highest level defense issue, issues at the European Council, looking for areas where we can better cooperate. If you look into the questions, and your country is on the forefront of this, how we can integrate uh, elements of our armed forces in order to make more efficient use of limited resources. So I believe, personally, we have understood the wake-up call. But to be honest, I'm not convinced that in 2024 we will have 26 European countries reaching 2% of the GDP uh, for the defense budget, including Germany. I personally believe if we come to 1.5, it's more than sufficient if we spend it in the right way. If we then continue to have, have more integration in military capabilities in the European Union available for NATO, we can make uh, a better use of this money, and then we also can convince our American friends that the NATO is still relevant again. It's consensus in Germany that the army needs some billions more. It's no conflict between the important uh, German parties. On the other hand, I think the vast majority of the population in, uh, in uh, Germany is not convinced that 2% uh, should be reached, so it will be uh, will be used a little bit by the social democrats during the election campaign. They are especially critical about the two percent, <coughs> and and on the whole, for politicians, the internal situation and elections are more important than foreign policy. On the whole, so and this. This will be also the case uh, during the next years. And um, perhaps the German <clears throat> population is not, not or not yet sufficiently uh, of the opinion that, uh, we, that we really need a bigger army. Because even, even now the Western European NATO countries spend about three times as much for defense than Russia. Why should it be four times as much? All right, the second hand I did see from Martin Swarovski uh, from Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I have one, one remark that uh, refers to what has been said here by Mr. Bornemann. But before going that, only briefly uh, uh, 
to uh, react to what has been said about this uh, 2% uh, obligation. So Mr. Bondra mentioned here that the Trump administration probably would not buy the argumentation that, that in the uh, 2% obligation, the humanitarian aid and development aid should be counted. But at, on the other hand, what I, I read from, from the last meeting be, between uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel and, and uh, American president was that, the, that uh, uh, Ms., Mrs. Merkel tried to uh, uh, somehow defend the German position and argued that there are not only hard security measures as such, but some also soft security measures, and there are different ways ha how you can tackle terrorism, you know, uh, f focusing on, on financial base of, of terrorists in, in Europe and so on and so forth. And surprisingly, uh, the, the reaction uh, of Mr. Trump was not negative. He did not reject it. So which leads me to a conclusion, if this argumentation is well based and well argumented, it uh, can be even discussed with this with, with current uh, American administration. But what uh, Mr. Bonneman said uh, about the situation in uh, NATO Russia Council, and you, you listed uh, several elements that led to the situation, current situation, NATO Russia Council, and I think that there is another element and this is uh, uh, this is a perception of uh, Russia uh, Russian perception of, of NATO uh, I think that not the main problem is that that Russia would perceive NATO as a as a threat as such if you read strategic documents of Russia you, you rather read that uh, danger for Russia stems from NATO enlargement or reinforcement, but not NATO as such. But the problem is that uh, Russia do not regard NATO as, ally as genuine alliance as such. Because it has no historical experience with genuine alliance as such. Uh, Warsaw Pact was just a military toolbox. It was not genuine alliance. And it was also demonstrated this position of Russia, for instance, when there were debates about uh, reduction of uh, uh, tactical nuclear arms. The position of Russia was at the time that we can think of a reduction of our uh, tactical nuclear arms only if you Americans do the first step. That means you withdraw your American weapons from the European soil. That means they never acknowledge the fact that the tactical nukes in European soil are under NATO arrangements. They regard it just as American weapons. And I think that there is a task for us, Central Europeans and Eastern Europeans, to underline at every occasion that we feel to be a part of a really genuine alliance where you have your obligations and rights. And we can also use this argumentation, for instance, with uh, speaking with uh, Central Asian uh, states, because there, Russia is offering some security arrangements. And we can argue, we are a member of the Genuine Alliance. Is this what Russia offers you, also Genuine Alliance or military toolbox? So I think this is task for us, Central Europeans, to value the fact that we are part of Genuine Alliance. Uh, I fully agree with what you said, and uh, we always try to... I would not say educate, but to inform Russia what the difference between the Warsaw Pact and, 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 and NATO is. But there was always a perception NATO is nothing else than a copy of the Warsaw Pact. With one exception, it's the Americans who have to say what to do. Uh, so you, you're right. On the other hand, those people who worked in Brussels in the Russian embassy over time, when they had on a daily basis the experience what NATO really is and what the influence of every NATO member, be it Luxembourg or be it uh, Italy or Turkey, then they realize there is a difference. On the other hand, I have to say the fact that NATO still survived the Cold War was an element which was not understood uh, in, in, in the Russian policy. It was not really accepted. So NATO has still the, 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 the Cold War image of being the winner of the Cold War. Uh, but NATO expansion was seen as directed against Russia. I have always tried when I was in Moscow, and Ambassador, I'm sure you have done the same, uh, try to ask the Russians, have you ever thought about why the new democracies in Eastern Europe and even the former members of the Soviet Union 
after getting uh, independent, tried to come into NATO. We have not pushed for them. It was their will to come to NATO. Why haven't they gone to Russia and asked for security? We have never got an answer from my Russian colleagues. I got it. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, and the, the, the other point is also, we have to understand that some politics in Moscow are using NATO as an instrument to camouflage domestic problems. It's always easy to use an external opponent in order to explain why you are not uh, very successful in the economic side and in the reform side. And I think this, was ha this happened in 2014. When you see the, the, the polls of the population rate of Putin, it was in the end of 2013 at the lowest rate. And then Ukraine happened and it jumped up to 85%. So the misuse of the West as an opponent and as an enemy, as a threat, is also be used for domestic reasons. These are all points which we knew in the past but we have not realized them as an instrument in order to tackle them and to avoid them. If I may, one word only on the 2% issue. Uh, we now hear from President uh, Trump, it's not only the 2% in future, we should also pay uh, for, for the past. And he has made a bill to Germany of 100 and, uh, 380 billion US dollar, which we have to pay to the United States, like we have to pay for a bank. So this shows a little bit this shows a little bit how he sees uh, the mechanism of NATO. But I, what, what I wanted to say is there are some German politicians who seriously try to overcome the problem by saying, let's make a new deal with the United States. Let's talk about 3%, 3.5% or even more, but then look into the security area as a whole and say, what are we investing in our security, not only in defense? Because fight against terrorism is not only defense in the classical sense, it's a security issue. And there we are paying a lot of money, uh, and even development aid is an element of stabilization and therefore for security. So the question is, once we get into a debate with our American colleagues, could we make a new deal by saying, yes, we are not looking only in the defense issue, and the defense budget, but we look into the issue what are nations paying for their security in total? Uh, and then we can come maybe to a, to a new conclusion. I'm not quite optimistic that this works, but you sh it shows a little bit the dimension of the discussion in Germany. Thank you very much. Our time is up, uh, unfortunately. Oh. We are already uh, after uh, s uh, s uh, half past uh, six. Uh, I did see Charles. I did see uh, a hand there. Uh, but we can conclude in the corridors. So I will ask everyone to react on what has been said or on the state of the Czech-German relations and cooperation. Don't uh, leave now, uh, wait for a few more minutes. Uh, and I will start with uh, Peter, uh, who also said that he also heard the answer from Moscow regarding, uh, uh, regarding the question asked. <clears throat> yes, General. I, uh, I really asked the same question like you did. And I, from time to time, got the answer. Uh, they were looking at me like that I'm... Uh, confused puppets uh, in hands of uh, those uh, Yankees uh, because I came to okay. Moscow from, from Washington. But uh, in more general terms, they were speaking about uh, us like, about, not only about the traitors, but mostly as a confused guys who, are, who have elites who are bribed and manipulated from Washington. Uh, they simply couldn't believe that this is our free will to be part of uh, NATO and European Union just to uh, be secured because of them, like uh, imposing some threats to us. So that was uh, the usual uh, reaction. Uh, uh, speaking about uh, this dis discussion, this debate, you know, I, I think that we really need to do our best uh, together to defend our free elections. Uh, elections are the core of uh, free and fair elections are core of uh, uh, democracy. 
Uh, we have to uh, uh, try our best uh, on the level of experts, but also politicians to cooperate and find the ways how to uh, counter this disinformation campaign. By the way, uh, with their permission, uh, I have been uh, using for my in uh, information this uh, paper of European Values Think Tanks, uh, which is called A Framework Guide to Tools uh, for Countering Hostile Foreign elect Electoral Interference. And they have it on their website. Quite interesting and, I believe, pretty useful. So even NGOs have some role to play in this uh, combat, uh, which needs to be really very precise, because they are very effective, so we should be as well. Daniel, your last word. Thank you. Um, without further ado, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. I hope I haven't uh, been too pessimistic on you. Uh, we are working on, to, uh, on the issues I've been describing during my, my, my remarks. Um, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to, to speak with such distinguished speakers here at the panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Since I am going in the reverse order now, then Christian, please, your last words, comments. Thank you for the very interesting discussion, for the questions. I hope to be once more that I will have once more the opportunity to speak in this German-Czech uh, framework. And uh, thank you for your coming. Thank you, General. Thank you. I would uh, like to join the previous speaker by thanking for having the opportunity to stay with you here this afternoon. Looking into the future, I'm, I'm optimist. And I think we have to be optimists. And we have understood the wake-up call. Thanks, Mr. Putin. Thanks, Mr. Trump. And I would should add, also thanks, Mr. Erdogan, because he is also facing an issue which we have to tackle. And the wake-up call is uh, what Mrs. Merkel said. If you are faced with such problems, you have to stay together. And you have to tackle for your own business to the best for all of them, not against our friends in NATO, not against Russia, and not against er Erdogan, but making clear what our position is, that we are doing it better if we're doing it together. And in this context, I personally believe the German-Czech cooperation has a great potential to go ahead on this line, and we have all the instruments. The Lisbon Treaty allows structured cooperation in the defense area. We should start to begin it. And the Czech Republic is one of the candidates who is knocking at the door on the Lisbon Treaty. So, and I know from my, my German colleagues, we welcome very much this initiative, and I'm looking very much forward maybe in the next round of our internal discussion, what kind of progress our teams from the, from the Ministry of Defense and Foreign Affairs have reached and where we can contribute with our advice to bring this forward. I see a great potential in this area. Thank you very much. We are only 15 minutes after our time, so we are fine. I do thank uh, one more time the Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft and Hans Seidel Stiftung, uh, of course, Jagello 2000 and Inoji. Uh, I thank you all for coming to Prague, not only the two of you as speakers uh, right now, but all the other uh, German guests here in the room. Uh, and uh, I just hope that we will continue with that dialogue, and it's going to be an open dialogue uh, uh, and a critical one because by that we can be only uh, strengthened and we can uh, maybe see what is uh, happening uh, around us and what we are facing in the future. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice rest of the day. Have a nice rest of your stay in Prague and see you either here or somewhere in Germany in the future. Thanks. Thank you.